Please welcome the co-writers and co-directors of The Inbetweeners to Ian Morris and Damon Beasley. And the Inbetweeners themselves, Simon Bird, Joe Thomas, James Buckley, and Blake Harrison. Hello. Hello all. <laughs> Welcome. Um, now, I've been looking at the BBFC certification for this movie, which is 15, yeah. as expected, uh, and it's rated 15 for strong sex references, yeah. very strong language, oh, yeah. Keep talking. Yeah. drug misuse, mm -hmm. and more importantly, nudity. Who's nudity? Any of you guys uh, this time around? I wouldn't want to spoil it for anyone, to, anyone, but there's yeah. plenty of it. Not, yeah. not Joe for the first time ever, I think. <laughs> I think we worked out, we've seen every single part of Joe Thomas naked <laughs> at some more point between three series in a film, so but not that was, Joe. That was partly why we, you know, we'd said the last film was the last film with a, you know, the last part of the story was because at that point we'd managed to get all of them in various states of undress. I think, who was the last one to fall? Simon Bird? Yeah, you got a bit of my bum in the film, didn't you? <laughs> yes, bum we bum. did. You completed the in between his body parts bingo. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so and the game was over. Okay, so you're not saying exactly. Well, I mean, who just as is sort of is male nudity. I think that's probably the, uh, as it far goes as we can say. It's going to narrow it down. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, Damon and Ian, uh, let's talk about how this movie uh, came about. Because when the first movie came out, forty-two million pounds at the UK box office, biggest comedy in UK history. Uh, at that point, were you thinking a sequel immediately, or did someone? At what point did the prediction? No, we didn't. Come I out? think we, if we were uh, thought about the future ever, I think we'd have had an idea at least for a sequel. We had no, we never a single line written down, not a single thought about a sequel. And it was only really a few months later when we met quite a lot of people who said they really liked the show and they really liked the, the film, um, and they said to us, "Oh, you're doing a sequel then?" And we were like, "No." And they said, "Well, why? Why are you not doing a sequel?" And we went, "Don't." don't know <laughs> and they're like have you, you've all fallen out have you we're like no no we love working with you. it's great and they're like so wh why aren't you doing a sequel yeah. and we're like don't don't know <laughs> and it was sort of about the 20th time of saying don't know that i thought this is a bit embarrassing we we aren't really doing anything else it would be quite fun to do another one so yeah. we started thinking we talked to the guys about the idea of maybe doing it and then we just kind of but and here we are i mean three years is i think it's quite a long time for a sequel so but yeah, so it's basically we couldn't face stepping into another London black cab and being told by a cabbie that why isn't there a sequel? We'd always right. go, oh god, because yeah. yeah, cabbies love the inbetweeners. That's one thing that you write the inbetweeners. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I do, because it's very useful. No, but they're interesting. Just gets them off the topic of uh, UKIP. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're quite good though, because the cabbies are interesting mix, because cabbies are basically an interesting mix, it's incredibly inquisitive, yeah. tenacious, and quite blunt. So uh -huh. they basically go, what do you do then? <laughs> right. Right the in-betweeners. Yeah. Oh yeah, like that. You do another one? No, why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? Why not? So, so they, they lock the doors like, and just... Kind of yeah. They yeah. refuse to let you out until you make another one. That's yeah, basically. What happens. Okay. And, uh, and the guys, the actors, uh, at what point did this come about for you? And Were you reluctant in a way? Because I think... You know, you numerous so, interviews, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think we were really pleased with the last film that we brought out. We were really proud of it. And, uh, in, I mean, none of us ever thought it would be become as successful as it did. So we just felt that that was a natural end for the in-betweeners. We were all... We'd all discussed it, and we were all like, yeah, what a great way to sort of finish the in-betweeners. Um, and then it sort of gets to the point where you know still like two and a half three years later where people are s there's still that interest people are still saying can you do another one then and then you know we've also got this great idea of going to australia and then we also really love doing it we there was no more reason you know we, we ran out of reasons to not do it yeah anymore. we forgot why we didn't want to do it <laughs> Basically, simple as that. Yeah, yeah. we also massively underestimated because you know, for us, it was kind of like the the final piece of the jigsaw. But actually, I guess for the audience, it was the first time they'd seen them on the big screen, and it worked. You know, they were, and it suddenly was like, well, these guys have got a life beyond the TV show. They really felt like movie stars. Sorry, Thank guys, you. but you did. And uh, <laughs> and it, and it, yeah, it, it was sort of almost insane not to give it another another run, give it another go. So, how many uh, goes did you have before you 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 hit upon the you know, the story for this film, in which they go to Australia? I think we we 
didn't have many really. We sort of, we, we had the floated. We thought about an idea of a stag do, and then we remembered there was a film called The Hangover. It was about a stag do, and also it felt a little bit earlier a stag do for us as well. We kind of, you know, the, the situation, if you like, of the in between this was always that sort of sixth form life, and the idea of, you know, how you you start to try and expand the area, parts of your personality, if you like. So we always had this idea, like the real nutters have left school at sixteen, so you can sort of expand into a personality and test the water a bit more. And I think that goes even more so for when you leave school. Mm. And so for us, we were like, actually, what could they be doing at, at that age that isn't? So they wouldn't all be at the same university. They wouldn't all be in the same jobs. They probably wouldn't be in the same town. But you know, travelling for seven or eight weeks is the sort of thing they could all do together. And yeah. um, particularly to Australia, which seems like you know strangely. You know, it takes people from all walks of life, all sort of class and economic levels go travelling in Australia, I think. So that was quite quickly, it felt like that was the natural place to have those people, uh, those characters. And, and, you know, it's always been about friendship as well. And so really the situation, which is friendship and testing your personality, hasn't really changed. We just felt like Australia was a good good place to put them. Okay. And, uh, and starting with you, Simon, where are the characters when we meet them in, in, in this movie? Where's Will, for example? So Will is a university in Bristol. Um, and th it's very much like school, but a bit worse because he hasn't got these three anymore. So he's totally alone, uh, massively unpopular, um, and yeah, he's f flailing really. He he doesn't know he doesn't know what's going on with his life. Um, <coughs> so uh, he's still very much in touch with with Simon. Uh, and what's Simon up to, Joe? Uh, Simon, as you can see from the trailer, Simon's still with uh, Lucy, but things have sort of, uh, sort of decomposed slightly, <laughs> um, and uh, he's now basically been bullied by her. And um, but he's—I mean, Simon's not a particularly assertive person, and he's not really able to deal with his problems. And um, so, what he tends to do is run away from them uh, instead. Which I suppose leads neatly on to uh, Jay getting in touch. That's right. Yeah, Jay um, hasn't gone to university. It doesn't seem like he's got a job. So he d he d he d he's decided to go and live with his uncle, go and visit his uncle in Australia. Uh, and he emails Neil um, with a, you know a big long patter about how gorgeous the women are, how you know successful he is with them, how he you know he's this superstar DJ now. Um, and uh, Neil's obviously very impressed by that. Um, what's Neil? Neil's Neil is uh, Neil's just got a job, not gone to uni, uh, surprisingly. And uh, it basically, he's just uh, missing his best mate. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of assume that you know maybe maybe Neil's sex life isn't what it was without Jay's sex <laughs> tips, you know, because they, they work so well. Definitely, so, yeah. yeah. I think he just needs needs a few tips off of Jay, so he'll go literally halfway around the world to get yeah. those tips and, you know, so Neil, continue Neil's, his Neil's conquests. Miss, Neil's missing his mate, and, and, and Britain's not being too kind at, at the moment for these two for these right. two characters. Britain can be a cruel mistress. So it just, it, it make the, the, the guys just think, you know, sod it, if... if even if Aust Australia is ten percent of how great you know Jay is making out, it's definitely going to be better than their their situation that they're in at the moment. So they run off, don't they, to Australia and go go to surprise Jay out there. They do. It's it's, it's sort of it's a it's a running away from their problems basically, uh, in true flaky in between us style. And I think also there's a certain from Will's point of view, there's a certain sense of optimism that he always carries that thing of thinking. It'll be great when I go there. Everything will be brilliant. Okay, so you know, you know, school was going to be great, and it hasn't been great. But university is going to be great. Okay, it's not been great, but Australia, maybe that will be great. Yeah, he's excited. There's a new opportunity for him. Yeah. He sees it as uh, he thinks they're going to go travelling, whereas they think they're going on holiday, and that's sort of the tension at the core of the the film. I think is that he wants to meet new people and well, expand sort of his like, like-minded young adults and sort of yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Instead, he's stuck with these chumps. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as writers, uh, did you want to uh, create that sense in a movie of, of old friends who've been apart for maybe a few months, reconnecting and, and find it hard to reconnect in a way, that sort of awkwardness you get when you've been away for a while? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the, I think, without giving too much away, one of 
my favourite scenes in the movie is when the boys finally meet up with Jay in Australia and there is just all of that kind of like strange tension that exists between people who haven't seen each other for you know at that point in your life it's still quite a long time is it like three months it probably feels like a, a lifetime to them so that you know that part of it was enjoyable it's always a challenge really because at the start of the film we'd send them to sort of different corners of the of the in-between is universe and then <laughs> uh said earlier in the day it's a bit like the end of empire strikes back and <laughs> we have to get them all back together again i mean uh, I wouldn't, it's not exactly like the end of empire strikes back <laughs> i mean it's a very 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 no it's, 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 it's exactly like, well, exactly I, mean, like yeah. okay. I mean jay does get his hand chopped off that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what happens oh, oh no we got to keep that no quiet. spoilers yeah, yeah. and who knew that, don't mention that to anyone who knew that will would turn out to uh Betray them in the Cloud City. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so who's, who's Will who's is there? actually Neil's mum. That's the. Oh big really? Twist at the end. Oh, yeah, well, there's, there's a big shock. I yeah. am your mum. Uh, so who's who's who then? If we're going to continue this uh, Star Wars, well, yeah. Blake's, Blake's a Wookie. Yeah. <laughs> if you just You've check, got to check it out. I mean, I can I can prove to you that I'm a Wookie. I've got these. Uh, Almost tumnus like thorny <laughs> hair bands that you can see there. So that one's easy. No special effects required. Joe's, Joe's Luke Skywalker, I'd say. Joe's Luke Skywalker. He's virtuous. Do you take that, Joe? Are you happy with that? I'm I mean, happy with that, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Famously, I'm Yoda. You're right? Yoda. You've got to be Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> also, the, should I tell you, one of the, I don't know if you remember the episode where Simon did an impression of Yoda. What's particularly enjoyable about that is Simon had never seen any of the Star Wars I films. No, I have no idea so what So we were like, this about. is how you do Yoda. He's like, I don't know what that is. We're like, well, give us a go. And he did it. We're like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's great. Should we give it? Should we give, do you do it on top? What? Can you do it? Can you do it? Nah. Oh. <laughs> That's a rubbish what impression of you. What Buckley? What's Buckley? What's Buckers? Buckley's. I don't, oh, know. don't make him hand so no, 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 come I down in that. I was thinking like Darth Vader, right? I was thinking like Jawa. He's a Jawa. I was thinking of Jawa. There you go. Jawa. Well, who's that Wicket? Is it Wicket? One of the really rubbish Ewoks. Ewok. Yeah. 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 You're that. Chief Chirpa, surely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna throw one out there. See what happens. We have a clip. Oh, uh, okay. I guess talk okay. about how or, you know you guys pick up the old rhythms again. This is a a, a scene during a, a road trip. You know you you don't you don't know what this clip is. Do you? <laughs> so it's the, the, uh, the, the raw fish. Raw fish. Yeah. Raw fish. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Let's take a look at the clip. Thank you. Correct. Yes or no? Raw fish. Yeah. Just like, one person with you. at the back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you, you, obviously you'd rather a Nando's, wouldn't you? Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. James. I like. I love a bit of sushi. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Clever. Joe. What was the question? Raw fish. Yes or no? Oh yes. Obviously. I'll go yes. Okay. <laughs> Ian? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I had my first raw fish October last year. First bit of sushi. Really? Of what? How? Got, uh, How? Just because I eat, I basically eat like a child. Or I used to eat like a child. So I'm <laughs> slowly starting to eat Suckling vegetables. His mother's breast. <laughs> <laughs> Not the only one. <laughs> Now there's a there's a big evolution in this movie in terms of your roles uh, on the on the film because you stepped up to co-direct this yes. one, uh, and I believe that <laughs> you weren't treated with respect necessarily by your actors. No, I'd like to say it was kind of like a sort of like came from a, a place of you know love. Nope. The, no, it didn't. No, it turns out it didn't. No, it's just sort of every opportunity they got, they would try and undermine our. Authority. Well, no, you were great, Damon. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take it all back. Thanks, guys. Uh, you know, they, uh, we've spent a long time over the sort of like last seven years cultivating a sort of. They were such good friends, and it was very clear from day one that they all got on. And we used to like, you know, love hanging around and watching them do it. And so we, we've been like terrible parents, really, is that we sort of encouraged them to be as naughty as possible in between doing takes and sort of enjoyed it because someone else had to deal with it ultimately. But. You know, now we're directing. That's all come back to sort of completely haunt us. Um, and yeah, it was you know, it yeah, was well, great, great fun. Uh, uh, one of our earliest memories of doing this show is at the end of the first week's filming of the first series, Ian and Damon were taken aside and told <laughs> off by the first assistant director for winding us up too much in between takes. So when they became the directors, we sort of treated it. It was a bit like one of those moments in school where like the kids put in charge of the class for a while the teacher has to pop out for a minute so we treated it as a sort of surreal joke like oh yeah they're the directors there was yes, a great director. I remember do what you was say. A, there was a brilliant <laughs> moment on the very first week of shooting and like can we done some rehearsal with them but there was a moment in between takes where we all was i remember we were standing around and james was telling us about being in a band and we asked him about being in a band because we were just sort of like just being polite finding out about one of them and said what's you know what's the best thing about being in a band he said the best thing about being in a band is you get to be indoors at night. That's not what I said. That is what That's you said. said. That is a hundred. A rare opportunity. And that was sort of the start of 
everything we really said. imitated is because what you said. We spent the next. I was making a joke. Five of us. I was making a joke. I was being. I was being ironic. I said the best thing about being in a band is that it gives you license to wear sunglasses indoors. Number one. Never be ironic. You never said license early on. You never even know the word license then. So that's not true. So this is basically how it, that's basically how the whole Lots relationship was formed. A, yeah, and it sort of continued yeah. right up until now. Was there a, a war of attrition? Because you guys told me about wiping off the names, you know, yeah. Damon Ian's names from the slates, and replacing yeah. them with more famous directors. Is that yeah. is that yeah. true? Yeah. Not just more famous directors, just basically anyone. By and the end, it was yeah. anyone. Literally, like a, I think there was one point where it didn't have we were trying to th- work out a shot, and I could hear them having a conversation, literally this far away from me. I was trying to talk to the DAP about alienation and why this scene tells alienation I could hear them saying why don't we dig up a corpse from the cemetery and that might be more useful as a director and I was thinking <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate this is a funny a joke funny day. but I am in the yeah, middle of tree. working don't talk about alienation difficult. then it's pretentious we were there was a lot of like so whose turn is it to be director next is it me is it mate do you want to be director because they're just giving it to just anyone just anyone jump days. in just anyone's got any director ideas at all because we are struggling here who takes no, well direction? done, there, guys. Who takes direction best out of the four? Uh, Joe Thomas. Oh, looks kind of Joe <laughs> Thomas. Yeah, very committed. <laughs> I think I'm naturally quite obedient. Like I don't, I don't like um, getting in trouble fundamentally. Like I will do it if they're all mucking around because I'm weak. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, that's not just on set, is it? I mean, that's just in life in general. You tell Joe to do something, he will. Yeah, do you'd it, be so. a great Nazi. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, no questions asked. What do you need? <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who's most disobedient? Who mucks around most? Who who wastes most film? Who do you think? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Who looks the least professional of these four? <laughs> I couldn't possibly say. Well, but they're all pretty good, to be fair. No, no, yeah. there's not an awful lot of film wasted. Because, I mean, unlike you know, I hear, and you know, hear anecdotally about stars not coming out of their trailers and that. These guys just love being together. So actually, being on set and mucking, you know, they're there before us most mornings, and you know, just messing around and doing it. So yeah, there was a time when we were at Sydney Harbour, and um, we were, it was sort of dusk, and we were trying to set the shot up. It's a big sort of opening shot of Australia, and. Uh, they were there on set when they didn't need to be, and we we're like, okay, well that's great, and we're really happy you're here. And then we turned our back, literally just turned our backs, and you could hear Simon Bird and Blake saying to Joe, "Joe, get in the harbour, get in the harbour." Oh. And, and as we turned back around, Joe literally had two legs over; he was holding on the back. We're like, Joe, don't go in the harbour. It's go back to your train. There's no need for you yeah. three to be here. Don't put your face in the fire. Don't, don't jump it's in. Always, don't, also, always don't jump in Sydney Harbour, Joe. We're about to start filming. <laughs> always. In the background is Simon Bird just yes. Simon like, Bird. Simon Bird plants a seed of an idea, and then Buckley and Blake and Joe get carried away with it. Yeah. <laughs> and then Bird just stands <laughs> back and watches the mayhem that he's caused. And then he's nowhere to be found. Yeah. <laughs> never blamed. Never blamed. Yeah. You stand there going, "Well, look he's, what they're doing over there." Ve- he's very much the Charles Manson of the group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of like. I'll take that. Co- got yeah. Charles Maybe Manson, like uh, a Nazi, Nazi. <laughs> a perfect Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> That's going well. Yeah. So, I mean, um, what, what was the experience like of uh, filming the, in Australia, though? Because I know you were obviously in Sydney, but you were also in a place called Mary, which yeah. is way in the outback. Uh, what was that like? Uh, it was amazing. I mean, it was. But I mean, it, it kind of had its own challenges, but oddly, those challenges made it more fun. Like it was up to fifty degree heat at times, and the flies were literally everywhere they're all over your face in your eyes in your ears and ian and damon would be at the mo- monitors saying oh it, if the camera's on you don't swat the flies away because you know we can't see them on screen but obviously you've got like five just crawling around you so you're desperately trying not to swat them away and as soon as the camera goes on to someone else you're like oh, and then it's back on you and you're like yes there's my line and my line is this and i'm back doing this that's a long-winded way of saying act. <laughs> act, <laughs> act like act there are like flies. There's not five <laughs> creepy crawlies all over your face. No, the there flies, were, there the were, flies were amazing. Flies, so they were what? absolutely amazing. They, what, they call them sticky flies, didn't they? They were yeah. like they were the, the laziest flies. They like when the morning they had a little bit of spirit. If you went they? like that, they would just jump and then go back on your face. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't leave you alone. Luckily, they wouldn't get the hint. Our producer Spencer Millman is one of the sweatiest human beings you'll ever meet. So I would always go and stand near him because what he was just giving off. Fly, fly scent. They loved it. They just, if you had like, they were disturbing you. Go find Spencer, just walk by him, and they'd leap over. It's to like him. when there's wasps and you leave a little pot of jam, so they all kind of <laughs> go around the jam. 
but they were funny because they would they would by about three in the afternoon the flies would be like oh it's too hot to fly now and they just get on your back do you remember oh. that? And you turn around, you see someone's back, and you're like, oh, my God. And if you accidentally got in a car without check cleaning your back, it was just, I mean, it was horrendous. So flies were an issue. I mean, we, would, we all drove out there together. I drove the car, and the four guys came with us. And there was a point about two hours into this drive. Oh. No, it's not that story. It's not that story. <laughs> there was a point two hours in the drive where something happened that will never, ever be spoken of. But, uh... No, it's fine. It's okay. It's too I wasn't weird. here, so I'll tell you one thing. The, there is video but evidence, but have you deleted that? Oh, God, I wasn't that? even going to... I mean, why are you doing this? <laughs> now you make it sound even weirder than it was, and it was pretty but weird. Let's not make this weirder than Chatty okay. Man. <laughs> no, so basically... Oh, actually, what, should I tell you the weird story? No. no. I will do, okay. So the weird story is basically this. We got there, we all stopped off for a wee. <laughs> They went out for a wee, and then we were like, look, the point is, you're no totally, alone. totally you're alone. You're totally alone. Yeah. There's We'd no one no around. We'd no cars. We'd see nothing How at all. How often does that opportunity the, In your life, you, you know, literally nothing, nothing. Miles around, two hours driving, you could do nothing. Anything. Nobody could do anything. And, I, and what the story I was going to tell you was that there was a point where I was thinking, I wonder if this is how proper film directors work, which is to get an idea of nowhere in the desert, they go to nowhere in the desert with everyone. It's a bit like saying, we want to shoot a thing on the moon, we better go to the moon. I mean, it's that kind of level of control. Anyway, so we're driving, we stop, stop for a piss, everyone has a look around. There's like, and Joe said, I think, this is incredible. There's nobody here. We could literally do anything. And then James came back from having a week with his trousers around his ankles and his, in his pants because he was like, we can do anything we want. And it was quite funny. And he's horrible old wife fronts he wears during the day, as we learned today. Boxers at night, wife fronts during the day. And then, uh, and then basically, I was like, okay, well, let's, so why don't we all just drop our pants because that's a hilarious thing we could do. I know. We're not our pants, our trousers. So we all dropped our pants. And then Blake didn't because Blake is, I'd argue, the most sensible. And That's then, fair. And then we yeah. like, we it was like, like the sensible one in we all like, the flies who uh, you can't gets see, killed. You can see nothing. You can see nothing miles around. So basically, and he said to me, and it's weird, and it's not, it doesn't get better. I'm just saying, you weren't walking away wondering what it was. I'm just going to tell you the weird thing. It's going to be over soon. There was a weird bit and where we were going to Blake, like, take your trousers down. Take your trousers <laughs> down. <laughs> I think at one point, Blake, down. join in. I think What's at one point, we were like, we're literally like, come on, Blake, be a team player. So, uh, so anyway, Blake turns around, he's about to do it. We're all facing this way, he sort of, and Blake goes, car. And we go, Aah! Aah! He starts getting, he hasn't in a car for two hours. And so we're like, oh, I'm panicking. We're tripping up, trying to run. We must have looked like the biggest freak. I mean, this is the weirdest like, thing. Oh, well, they've they've driven out not... to the outback together. <laughs> but it's not even that. It's just Get like, it's, it's, just... <laughs> it's not even that. We're not even, we're, we're, still even... we're still in a circle. We're still in a circle with our trousers on our ankles. We're not even, do you know what I mean? Like, nothing's happening. Happening. It's just totally weird, and then and they were like, oh god, so we sort of bundled back in the car. We're like, okay, at least it's going to be the the first assistant director and the director of photography who we know really well. And they drove past. It wasn't even them. It was just some people. We're like, no, do you oh know who it was? God. It was like when we went to the desert. We had to get different caterers who we'd never met before. We sort of ran the unit, and and it was them. So it wasn't just that they went by and never saw you again. And thought it was weird. They would turn up at the hotel later yeah. on. They'd never seen you before. They didn't even know oh, who yeah, you were. They, we, then they saw you yeah. when they arrived, and I saw them all get in a huddle immediately and yeah. start saying. I know so I spotted guys, them as well. We, I guys, we are the they, they, they must be they staying here as well. talking to each other going, well, they get up to some weird stuff. <laughs> it was <laughs> so weird. Because it was, it was sort of... It wasn't sexual. It just looked very, very. And bearing in mind, if you've been in the desert, and you've seen nothing for two hours to then see that, and you sort of come over a rise. Oh, that must be some. Well, that's the weird. bit where the, there is a video but of there it. Was a bit bit, where the there was a bit where we, so, we were so scared because we thought oh. they're going to be like these oh, yeah. outback tough guys. They're going to see a load of sort of British poms with their trousers <laughs> around their ankles, and they're just going to shoot us. Yes. They're going to lynch us or something. On reflection, it's quite weird that we were videoing it. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, yeah it's all no, but I, well. I started videoing because what happened was I started videoing because what, what happened is that again there's nothing there's incredible vastness and the road is kind of like just a bit that's been over a bit more so it's not even like it's you know curbs or anything like that and James went for a wee and Blake stood honestly what four feet to the right no, of him? and he could have stood he stood yeah. right absolutely next to me he could, he could have anyway. the outback is I mean, a dangerous place it's best it's to wee in company it's honestly like the vast so I like to get out it's like a shot of like you know and there's James Wing, and then slightly to the right, there's this endless sort of blue sky and horizon. So that's why I was videoing it, and then obviously, too good an opportunity to, to miss when we all... Anyway, let's... We, let's oh, you, must have other you must have other questions, you must have other questions. So um, this isn't... These cameras aren't recording. <laughs> that's fine. Not, not, that's not streaming live the internet right now. Uh, <laughs> Is it? I don't think I can ask a question that would possibly follow that up. So I'm going to throw okay. it over to you guys now. If you have any questions for uh, Damon and Ian in the cast, then Why? please do put we've your hands up. There, we've silenced them. <laughs> 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 Just one. So can we, can we leave? <laughs> yeah. 
Let's all take our trousers off, shall we? Hello. It's very Hello. liberating. Um, I am Australian. <laughs> oh, yay. We love Australians. Yeah. Um, so a lot of sort of like British and American films have a lot of Australian stereotypes when Ooh. they're set in Australia. What sort of stereotypes can I look forward to as an Australian in this film? Well, well you name them. Oh. Uh, yeah, if you Jay's watch, got a lot of if them, you watch the first five minutes of the film, we, we tick them off pretty yeah, well. We're trying to get it out of the way, don't we? Yeah, I think so. I, li I lived in Australia when I was 15 for six months as an exchange student, so I've tried to replicate a lot of the things that happened to me then, uh, which is just lots of terrifying men in Queensland, really. But there's also drop bears. Yes. We've put some drop bears in, so you'll enjoy that. They are very scary, the drop bears, so. What are drop bears? Uh, oh, buckers. Oh, well, well, actually, Blake, you got. Blake, you know about you drop bears. Well, you got done, didn't you? Got done, didn't you? Well, no, Joe did. Joe no, got very no, convinced Joe that there was a yeah, story. Tell story, tell story. He, got, he basically didn't get the joke and got done twice about, about tell the, the story. Though, it's a story so we, we uh, me, well, James unfortunately was working on this day, so me, Simon, and Joe, in classic in between us fashion, went on a wine tasting tour, <laughs> and uh, there was a couple of Australians that came with us, and when we went out for uh, a little bit of lunch. Uh, they were basically talking about, uh, you know, you make got to make sure you watch out for the drop bears. They're these bears. They're about, you know, kind of a, that that kind of size, and they will just drop out of the trees, and they've got such long claws that they just dig into you and just don't let go. And uh, Joe was was I quite petrified. I of was them. like, okay, man, okay, okay, man. But yeah, that I'll be, I'll doesn't be, I'll that like, doesn't yeah, sound insane I'll in out. Australia, though, does it? No, where so every, where they, every creature is ready to sort of just that, beat you up. So it's that, not it's, even it's, it's, the drop bears don't exist. It's a myth that they tell British people. And then, but Joe just was very concerned the whole day, by all accounts. But when when Joe was told that, he then went, "Oh yeah, I remember someone telling me that years ago." <laughs> He'd forgotten that he'd already been told about the drop bears, <laughs> and then was like really getting anxious over these drop bears again. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Cheers, guys. Great show. You said Thank this you. was, you said that this one was like the Empire Strikes Back. So do you think well, there will be a Return of the Jedi equivalent? Oh, Interesting. No. no. This is more like the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi into one. And when, and also, it's nothing like any of those things <laughs> as well. It, no. I mean, being serious, we, you know, we talked about the last film was originally the, uh, you know, the end point for us, and for you know mainly down to the fans and the success of the first film, we felt, you know, we had to at least try and give another, another story a crack. And, but this one really is, I think there's the thing with the in-between is we always, we always wanted that story to be about, you know, a time of your life before you become a full adult, really, where you are an adult, but no one takes you seriously. So you can sort of, there's, there's a certain charm to some of the kind of like horrific things that they say and do during that period, because they're just trying out stuff, you know, they're, they're not really being listened to by anyone and I think as you grow once you kind of get beyond that point where you split up from those friends that you you made purely through geography really you know I think a lot of the, the charm will start to ebb away and you know as I you know it sounds insane but we don't want this to be a, a, a sort of franchise thing I think you know this film really does you know for us is the end of it it is kind of the death of the in between us so it's quite quite sad really yeah uh, we're all quite sad about it um but um we I think we're all quite we like to do bigger and better each time, and I think we've really, as I <laughs> described <laughs> earlier, shot our load <laughs> on on this film. You know, we went out to Australia, and it's epic, basically, for you know, especially for a British film. And I don't think we're going to manage to top that, unfortunately. Is there a sense as well that there's a point where you don't want to become too old to play these characters, or that there's a so insane? I'd do it you forever. Would <laughs> I would do it forever if we, you know, if we, if we, if someone, you know, if we could guarantee that we we're going to up the ante each time. Mm. I think unfortunately, there will come a time when, like, in between us and space, it will, it will go down. So you need to cash your chips in. Yeah. You? Yeah, I think a lot of long-running comedy characters, but you know, we we sort of found them when they were adults, and so you know, they're sort of like they can exist in you know, probably endlessly. But I think with the you know, part of what it is to be an in-betweener is definitely something to do with that age in your life. You know, that's what we're exploring, and I think that's you know, we've taken it really to the end point of that. So, uh, so no, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> but at the same time, everything's a trilogy these days, and you never know. You might get an. Oh, we do. A, we might do a prequel, Ooh. and uh, <laughs> oh. you know, with child actors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any more questions? There's a gentleman over here with his hand in the air. Thank you. And then right at the back as well. Hi guys. Um, obviously, you guys have created some amazing, iconic slogans in your time. Something to do with buses, for example. 
uh, which I've shouted to several people on occasions. Um, now I'm one of them. Um, but in terms of when you're on set, what's the kind of ratio between the improv side of it and how much of that sort of stuff is created while you're there versus how much is scripted? It's, I mean, Ian and Damon spend so long on the scripts, so they're, they're pretty much set in stone by the time we get uh, on set. There was a little bit more improv on this film than there has been on the series or on the first film. But really, not not much. I think what's great, I mean, also what makes it much more fun for us, and it means that we can concentrate even less, <laughs> is that uh, Ian and Damon know how we sort of naturally talk so well. Like, uh, when they write lines, I can read them and hear Joe saying them or hear Blake yeah, saying them. It's almost like you don't need to practice them or rehearse so you them. Just, or <laughs> learn, just learn them in they're some just cases. There. It's just, it's like a... It's like a flat pack film, ready to sort of, you just okay. need to open it up. Thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, no, no, I'm just like saying everything's done already. Like, uh, like it's, it's, the, everything's completely thought out. That You don't have to go, you know, oh, w there's never a time when you go, oh, I don't think my character would say that. Because these two guys have already done that. They've already thought, they know what the characters would say. And it, it just means that we can turn up and do the lines and then uh, take the piss out of them in, in yeah. between the... I would say all the improvisation that goes on set, and it is brilliant, by the way. I mean, Thank they you. are four of the funniest you know people I've ever met. And I you know all of the energy for improvisation goes into coming up with creative ways to undermine our position as directors. So <laughs> it's draining. It, it, is, it is draining. There's not a lot left to go in the film. We're exhausted <laughs> by the time we come to set our lines. Yeah, we yeah, are so knackered. You, but we've been very lucky, I think, as writers first and as directors. And, you know, it's it's such a long journey from the page to the screen for any joke. And for so many of the jokes that we write, to, to make it to screen and to be delivered so brilliantly by them and to be in the past directed so brilliantly by Ben and other people. It's just, you know, that is the dream, really, for anyone who sets out writing comedy. And we've been really, really um, lucky. Do you remember Ben? <laughs> oh, I love Ben. Oh, he was good, wasn't he? Great director. Very experienced, was, very experienced director. That was a golden Beautiful years. man. Really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a question that my hero read the very Ian, you were going to say you saw him last week. Is that right? like basically, I see him regularly. You haven't seen him at all. <laughs> <laughs> if you can just keep your hand up, please, man. Um, is there any parts of the film which really made you cringe? Yeah, I think there's, yeah. Yeah. there's a couple yeah, of... It, it, we can't so really divulge too I, many I've moments, really, because it would ruin the joke for you. But I, I mean, I, I know what's coming in the film. And even when we watched the screening of it last week, I was watching moments through my fingers because it was that gross or cringeworthy. So I, I don't, if you like cringe, you won't be disappointed. Yeah, there's a couple of bits, I think. I've got, I, thought I, was, I thought I was at the stage where like, I can't really cringe at anything, but there's a, a bit that Simon does where I was like, that is, he's taking it, he's taking it up a level. <laughs> he is taking it, if, I, if I'm feeling awkward at this moment, then uh, <laughs> he's doing something very, very special. Excellent. Uh, yes, please, right here at the very, very back. Thank you. Well, if this is the end for the in-betweeners, have you ever given a thought, uh, like J.K. Rowling has done for Harry Potter, and give it a little postscript about how they end up in 20 years' time? I haven't, but that is a brilliant idea. Yeah, I think we'll... Uh, yeah, we could do that, couldn't we? Yeah. We know where that's going to... We know that's going. One yeah, we, we of them's on drugs. The funny thing is, we did do... when we Before we wrote even a single uh, line of the first script, we spent, you know, a week going through those characters and talking about where they'd been 20 years and where they were now and where they'd been 10 years ago and stuff so we've got a, we had a sort of fairly good idea of, wh of what was going to happen to all of them so we could do that Trouble is it just wouldn't be very interesting <laughs> it'd be like, it's a bit boring they all just because that was the, the other thing about the in-betweeners I think that we've always tried to put into it is that whatever they say and what they get up to in these days you, they're fundamentally nice good people like they're not going to be in prison they're not criminals they're not trying to really destroy people's lives they're actually fundamentally very nice and it's just going through that bit where you're testing the boundaries and seeing what you can get away with, I guess. Even Jay. Uh, any more questions? Yes, please. This. Uh, last weekend, uh, I went to the pub and I said that I was coming here today and all my friends started arguing about which member each of the other ones were <laughs> with the in-between us. Uh, I've just left work now and I said where I was coming and they all started arguing about who was briefcase, who was bumdar. Uh, it was real good day. Uh, you guys, do you actually feel like not you're going to say that you are like them people, but do you actually think he is actually like him or, you know, he, well, do, do, do you think he could swap roles? I think... We We're know. not allowed to well, say that James is like Jay, are we? I mean, yeah. No, I wouldn't <laughs> like to be. I was locked up. 
I think it's slightly. Blake's un- I mean, not as stupid as Neil, obviously. I mean, we. I think we Blake's were exactly the same as Neil. <laughs> no, Blake. We were talking Blake, today. Blake, we don't have a script. Too. He does improvise all of those. Well, he doesn't improvise. We just film him. He doesn't know we're filming yeah. him. So it's like Bowfinger with Blake. Who were you, who? Who did your friends say that you were? Well, well, my name is Will, so there was definitely our you briefcase. Good on <laughs> no, you. Yeah. The, good I mean, it's, it's slightly unfair for the guys because we wrote the first series before we cast any of them, and. You know, we had these characters in mind, and they were pretty strong characters. But the truth is, over the next two series and the, and the last two films, we've kind of written towards their strengths, you know, comedically, and also even when, they, when they're mucking about and they do things that they make us laugh, we kind of push towards that a bit. So actually, they end up, you know, just with little ticks and things, seeming a bit more like their characters than they actually probably really are. It's just that we've heard them or seen them do funny things that we uh, we liked and put in. There was an interesting postscript to that question about the, uh, if you could switch oh, yeah. for another role, which oh, yeah, one would you go for? A good question. Like, start with question. When, like. when we originally auditioned and I was looking at all the 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 roles, it was like a kind of cattle mart audition and like there was so many actors there and I saw all the roles on the table and I was just flicking through them quickly and I thought, oh well, maybe I could do a J. I I probably won't be a Will, I definitely won't be Neil, I think I'd be more like Simon because when I was younger I was quite a hopeless romantic, just, just embarrassingly bad with women and then uh, I walk into the room and she sees my gormless face and when, oh, oh Neil, I was like, oh brilliant, I'm not going to get this part, I haven't looked at those lines and... There you go, natural stupidity wins again. <laughs> I, I, I actually played Neil in the pilot. In the yeah. Bit, yeah I was, um, but I wasn't very good at it. No, what I happened was... They just was needed to sex the part up a bit, I, I think. Did, that's, yeah, that's we that's were, we were talking kicking. about recasting yeah. after that pilot, because we made some mistakes as uh, producers of that. And uh, when they were talking about the role of Jay, they were, you know, and we kind of were talking about who was going to play Jay, and you'd played Neil, hadn't you, in the pilot? Yeah. We, you know, we discussed you and said, oh, yeah, after knowing him, now after spending a, <laughs> eight days filming with him, we're morons, he's obviously Jay. He's got to be Jay, hasn't he? What was great, though, is that I got a phone call from my then agent <laughs> saying, um, I've got some good news and some bad news. Um, good news is, is they're, they're going ahead with the in-betweeners. <laughs> um, bad news is they're recasting. I was like, well, that's, that's, there's no good news there for me. <laughs> You're fired. Is your agent <laughs> Darren Lamb from uh, Extras? <laughs> I think, yeah. It was pretty much that. Thomas, who could? Oh, actually, who would you play? Bacchus? But no, no, that's the thing as well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known about the audition for uh, for Jay because I, I sent yeah. you a message saying, oh, like, well done, congratulations, got you done. Not going to come along for the ride. And then you went, no, we're, we're seeing you next week. Would, <laughs> would you mind if you came in and, and maybe read for for the role of Jay? I mean, no, I wouldn't mind at all. I'd love to. I'd just been told I hadn't had a job five minutes ago by my actual agent. <laughs> but it's me, because I've got reached out to you, I've managed to possibly get some more work. So does that mean you owe Damon 10% of everything you've earned since? Is Damon your... Yes. your you owe yourself uh, 10%. You, you listen, just, that's I've, your own commission. I've made you money. <laughs> <laughs> I've made you enough money. Uh, you're, who, you're who, who, right. who else would you play? <laughs> <laughs> who else would you play? Who else would I play? Um... Who did I say earlier? You said uh, Neil's dad. Neil's dad, yeah, I'd like to do that. I'd get like a bald wig. <laughs> All right. No, Neil. Jay? I don't know, I mean, I, again, when I, when I was reading for it initially, I think Will and Simon were the two ones that seemed kind of maybe doable to me. I think because they were both sort of posh-ish. Um, and... Uh, I mean, but I don't think they were. I think <laughs> <laughs> not Simon to definitely wasn't. They're not meant to be, are they? In fact, when we finished doing the first series, um, uh, it's Damon and well, they they sent us all like a card to say thanks for doing it. I think it's Damon put in my card. Uh, thanks so much for playing Simon. Uh, we never thought he could be so funny, and then in brackets also weird. <laughs> Which probably wasn't really the the point of what they was really what they're after. Uh, so I think by this point we've kind of moulded so much to our characters. I don't think any of us could play any of the other ones. Who would you, who'd you like to? I do love Neil. I mean, I think he's. I love his innocence. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah, uh, he's he's a he's a good. He's got a good heart. I think he's quite kind. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, I go Simon. with. Um, I quite like if. If I could play Gilbert and Greg Davis could play Will, <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a short Gilbert and a tall Will yeah. would be uh, pretty be pretty good. That that would be amazing. I think we've got time for one last question. Yes, please, right here in the front row. Hi guys. Uh, 
What are your plans uh, now the Inbetweeners has ended for good? Well, what's really great about the Inbetweeners is um, that uh, it gives us a lot of time to sort of decide what we want to do next and none of us ever rush into doing anything unless we really want to do it. And um, Blake? Blake? <laughs> Blake does a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've got various uh, <laughs> sitcoms and shows that only ever go for one series. I'm sure they'll, uh, you know, I'll keep getting more of those. Um, yeah, but uh, Keeping Rosie is still out at some picture house cinemas. If you want to go and see me do oh, some kind of psychological... Shut, well, you oh, shut up God. about Keeping Rosie. You know, Rosie. just stretching my uh, acting muscles, uh, doing something serious. You know, no big deal. Can Don't you worry get about out it. Of Maxine Peake's ass for one <laughs> minute? <laughs> oh, well, make me, mate. <laughs> but yeah, I think... Um, what are you doing, Joe? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I suppose a little we bit... We like writing, don't we? I we think both we've both think, to write. Yeah, it. and I think Simon as well. I think we all kind of have ambitions to, to try and write something of our own. And in a way, Ian and Damon... Good luck. Well, I, no, yeah, well, and then maybe we yeah, can direct it enough. one day and then the cast can mercilessly take the piss out of us <laughs> until we're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, just that. It suits, I've got the nervous it breakdown It sort of suits me as well because... I've got sort of two kids at home and stuff, so I can write and I can be at home. And that's what I'm going to spend the next year of my life doing, I think. Simon? Indoors during the day. Indoors. <laughs> indoors at night. Sunglasses at night. <laughs> yeah, ditto, really. I've got a... We've got a, we've got a few things bubbling under. Don't worry about <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm doing a... I'm trying to write an adaptation of a Philip Pullman book. Uh, which won't be <laughs> <laughs> that's basically it it's, like, it's a bit like Blake doing his serious acting is I really I'm, I'm really clever and I want to be taken really seriously but uh, also we've, we're trying to write some other comedy stuff so which will be much much better I'm, than that I'm planning to become an expert at jet skiing that's my <laughs> I've got to find a lake somewhere in Dorset that allows jet skiing, if anyone knows that. But that's it, yeah. I'm going to wow. spend my time wisely. Have you jet skied before? We, just the one time. We, we went out just before the You've start of the shoot. You've been obsessed with it ever since. I <laughs> absolutely love it. We went out, though, and we took the boys out for a treat because uh, they'd done it before last time we were in Australia. It was sort of like a little tradition, wasn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, it was. Two, two of the funniest times I've had have been it jet skiing. Once brilliant. in Malia and once in Surfers Paradise. And the, the Malia one, I'd broken my wrist and just come out plastered about a day before. And I was like, I'll be fine in the jet ski. And we got out and basically I couldn't hold onto the bike on the way. So whilst everyone was going really fast, and the thing, it was in my eyes, I couldn't wipe my eyes, I couldn't take the other, the other hand off the thing. So I was basically like this. What, what, what was brilliant was that because of the way Ian is, like he's sort of an expert on everything. So so it was like, follow me, lads. So he he because he was in front he would then set the speed for the rest of us and they could you know they're called jet skis but he got to the first wave and crashed into it and just oh, oh the wrist has gone and then we just had to sort of like sort of potter about it was very circle. very like, slow we had, we had to that. keep sort of like 50 feet away from him and we're like God, yeah, so the second time, the second time we did a jet ski safari in Australia, which you can do for like three hours. And the, the two highlights of that were the, the people that ran it. Uh, because you have to do a safety talk beforehand. So the safety talk <laughs> in Mali was literally a bloke going, "That start, that stop, off you go." Safety talk in Australia was forty, fifty minutes. It was maybe? on a DVD. It was, it was on a DVD, and it was basically him standing next to the DVD, which was him standing next to the same wall saying things. It was and he goes, most, oh, no, by the way, it, it was right? the most, like talking about Australian stereotypes. It was the most oh, Australian yeah. you could imagine I mean, anyone could be because he, he was wearing stubbies and a full to make a DVD at 45 yeah. minutes length because he had to add every time there was an accident he had to add a new section <laughs> to his DVD <laughs> the insurance <laughs> and so he was he was skipping through it he was fast forwarding through those bits and going oh, you, well, that's but fine. then he sort of goes, I'll tell you this bit and we're like well you're it's the bit you're telling us is exactly the same as what's on the DVD. But he'd be like, oh, yeah, so basically what you might think is you see your mate fall off and you think I'm going to go right up to him and do a big curve and just <laughs> smash him in the face. But don't, don't do that. And we're like, okay. <laughs> we're like, okay. And and that that goes, he goes, please some, resist the urge. urge. The some best, idiot. He goes, some idiat. He goes, some idiot was there and he, was he, idiot, hit, he caught a, the, uh, the wake of a boat and he's just gone in the air and he's up there and he's about sort of 15 foot in the air and he's just hovering there. And you know what you're thinking? I wish I had a camera right now to take a photo at this moment. It looks awesome. We're like, no, that's not what no, it is. He's like, and he looks like he's up in the air and he's going, I wish I had a camera and it looks awesome. And we're like, did he die? Anyway, anyway so anyway, and there's another thing you can't do. We're like, well, it's, that's just like a story about something that The cool only thing happened. we really needed to know was that you had to connect yourself to the ignition. So if you fall off, 
it, the ignition comes out and the jet ski doesn't run off. And so at the end of this two hours, it was brilliant. We all around is, this the, the bay. The day before, the they producer took us had been sorry, was quick. The producer had phoned me and gone, Ian, I don't think you should do it. It's a tradition. We did it in Malia. So you, it's so insurance you shouldn't, issues. It's insurance cast. issues. Don't take the car out. It's a tradition. We did it that one time. One time. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I said, look, I said, I don't care what don't insurance say. Tradition. They're going to be fine. We're doing this. We're taking them out. Sorry, go no, but that was it. And then when we got at the end, because it had been in a bay, so it was very calm. And then he, he just took us out into some slightly choppy seas where just the mouth of the bay where it met the sea. And it was the sun was setting. And all I saw up ahead was a bit of a kerfuffle as everyone stopped. And Joe had fallen, managed to fall off of his jet ski into quite rough water. And he, the only thing we needed to know was that you had to connect yourself to the safety, sort of dead man's key, they call it. He hadn't bothered to do that. So the jet ski just <laughs> jet ski's going off. off. The waves are about yeah. six foot. He's disappearing. He, under. And it's sort of sharp. Water, this is a shark feeding. It was dusk, shark infested water. Dusk. And then, so that was better. Like, okay, Joe's got back. And then we drive back. And bearing in mind, we were shooting, I think, the next day, and their faces are relatively important for the film. Uh, James got oh, yeah. head butted a bee. Yeah. <laughs> he stuck by a bee on the head. I thought, I, like, oh, I, think I, I, thought am, that, I think I might be in trouble. Because I was behind Blake. And I thought that maybe like a stone had got into the jet and hit me in the head, but then it carried on stinging for so long, I didn't know what it was. And I sort of worked out that I'd maybe have just, because we were going so fast, I just like head butted a bee and it just stung me <laughs> the side of my head and it sort of blew up a bit. Not, bad, not recommended. It? Not recommended. On that bombshell, uh, that's, uh, that's a great note on which to end. Thank you so much for coming. The movie's out next Wednesday. Thanks for your questions. Thank, thank, you, very thank, you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Simon Bird, Joe Thomas, James Buckley and Blake Harrison. Thank, thank you. you. Chris.